Welcome everyone to week 12 of the ReaperNim ABCD uh, webinar, uh, workshop, my gosh, goodness. Anyway, today, uh, the last Q&A session to go over the lectures, uh, we will hold one more Q&A next week and that will be discussions of project week. And we're looking forward uh, to that lovely uh, uh, and exciting discussions. Please make sure to submit your project week proposals. We invite, uh, and today I think is the deadline for that. So make sure you get those in. You have a few more hours. Uh, we invite you to use the lectures from this week and uh, all of the weeks, you know, to think hard about what uh, fun projects you can uh, think of to work on. Uh, the deadline, as I said, is today. Uh, we have some amazing projects so far. Please take a look at the GitHub issues tab on the projects page uh, and paste them. Hopefully that'll get pasted into the uh, chat uh, and we'll, um, you know, get some more discussion. Our uh, staff and our TAs and our uh, lecturers will be looking over that, those this week and trying to provide some feedback as well so that we can uh, you know, get you some encouragement and uh, uh, feedback, you know, during the week. And if you do plan to join us at Project Week uh, and you have not provided the confirmation that you have your access uh, arranged, please uh, enrolled students go into the Canvas uh, site and complete your ABCD data access confirmation. Uh, we need that uh, to make sure we're all legal in terms of the data use and uh, participation during that uh, project week. Uh, when you get there, you'll upload your screenshot of your data access and uh, we'll have our final list of all of our eligible students uh, shortly. So I guess that's my high level introductions. I'll turn things over to Angie for some more introductions. Hi everybody, welcome to week 12, the last of our paired, <clears throat> excuse me, series of lectures. Um, I'd like to welcome Tara Madista. Tara, do you wanna say hi? Hi, yeah. Um, uh, just by way of introduction, uh, I was a faculty member for about 10 years at the University of Washington doing neuroimaging work. Um, and uh, I, about, about a year and a half ago, I moved to Amazon Web Services because some of my interest in computing and how to do things at scale. So, so I'm kind of a jack of all trades <laughs> at this point. <laughs> but uh, thank you very much for having me here. Excellent. Thanks so much. And Gael Veracol. Hi, uh, I'm a research director at INRIA, which is the French uh, Computer Science and, uh, and Applied Math uh, Institute. I did uh, machine learning for brain imaging for something like uh, 10 years. Uh, and actually very recently, uh, partly because of the COVID situation, but also for other interests, I've been looking uh, very much at electronic health records. That's basically what I've been doing this last year. Uh, and yeah, in a lot of uh, fundamental machine learning. Uh, so I think I am also a jack of all trades. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you both so much. Uh, this week's lectures, uh, the one from Tara was on longitudinal modeling and the one from Gael was on machine learning. So um, combined, we have been uh, providing with our students a lot of information about what to do with ABCD data once they get their hands on it. So moving it uh, to forward in, in, into this session, uh, James Kent is going to be our TA for today to help moderate the discussion. Hi, I'm James. Uh, I've already introduced myself earlier, uh, but I am in Austin currently and I'm surviving. <laughs> We're very glad to hear that. We are yes. uh, uh, very concerned about all of our friends in Texas this week. Um, I think that's it for me. So I will pass it off to Jessica for the rest of the announcements. Yeah, so um, we have just finalized um, a project week FAQ that we're going to be distributing soon. I know we've been getting a lot of questions um, from you guys in about how project week is going to go. Uh, so look for that in your inbox soon. Uh, in the meantime, feel free to keep reaching out to us. We'll answer your questions and help uh, support you in thinking about what project week will be like. Um, uh, next week, so as Angie mentioned, this week is our last week where we have invited a um, set of instructors uh, for answering questions about their lectures. Next week, we're going to go more into what project week is going to be like, how to prepare, what to expect, so on and so forth. Um, I am going to be sending out some emails to uh, the people who have uh, submitted those excellent project proposals to ask you to come join us for next week to give a brief, maybe two minute project pitch. Uh, the goal of that is to kind of introduce people to the ideas that you want to explore during project week and uh, try and facilitate uh, some other people to join your group so that you have a team to work on that um, project idea. 
uh, we have sent out another round of emails to observer students who have uh, been actively engaging in the course. Uh, and we define that as completing six or more data exercises. Uh, and those emails were invitations to join us for project week. Um, if you have not received an invitation, if you're an observer student and have not received an invitation to join us on project week, but you think you should have, um, send us an email and I'll look into what happened. Maybe it went into your spam folder or something like that. Um, but we are really excited both for today's uh, set of questions because I think that these lectures were really excellent this week um, and for tomorrow or not tomorrow, <laughs> next week's um, Q&A to talk about what project week is going to be like. Uh, so those are all my announcements for today. Um, let's get started on some of the questions that you guys submitted. All right. Uh, first, I'm going to ask you, uh, Tara, how should I compare model fit with different fixed effects versus models with different random effects. Relatedly, when, I sh when should I use REML versus ML when comparing model fits and when running my final model? Okay, so I will, I will preface all of my answers for everything by saying that um, I always worked with statisticians who provided me, ex you know, the, the best advice on everything. So, so please, uh, for, you know, please with questions, you know, find a statistician to talk to, but I'll give you my best understanding of, of what I what I would do. So what we used to do is we used to compare models with different um, things as long as they have the same dependent variable, which is the, uh, um, the statistic of interest or you know, the brain variable or whatever that would be with the AIC or BIC criterion. Um, and then there was a component about uh, I, the the, um, the REML and ML estimation. So my understanding for that is that ML estimation can be biased so that the estimation of variance can be either too high or too low, suggesting that one should use REML. Um, and we did that kind of in most cases, but I, again, I think there are certain cases where the estimates are very much similar, so it doesn't matter. Um, and cases where it really, really does. So it largely with higher dimensional data. Um, so so that, is, that is my understanding of that. Um, and uh, so again, for comparison, as long as the dependent variable is the same, we used AIC and BIC pretty consistently. Thank you. And keeping on, along with uh, mixed effects models, can a variable be both a fixed effect and a random effect? Yes, yes. So, so um, usually, and that would be when it's um, a discrete variable, something like, like time or like age. What the difference is, is when you have it as a fixed effect, you're looking at the effect of that variable on the outcome. When it's a random effect, you're looking at the uh, effect of the variance of that variable on the outcome. So, so that can make sense sometimes. And again, you know, that's very much a modeling question, whether it makes sense to do so in the context of your data. Thank you. Uh, and then I'm going to switch to a question that both of you can answer. And then I think uh, as a preface for all the rest of the questions, if anyone has additional input between the, the two of you, you can feel free to um, answer the, or add information to the question, even though I direct it to one person. Uh, so this question says, can I use cross-validation when fitting a mixed effects model? What more could I say about the mixed effects model if it generalized to new data? I guess maybe the first one. Can I use fixed? Can I use cross validation when fitting a mixed effects model? Is that a possible? Mm -hmm. So that that's directed so, to. Oh, go ahead, please. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I think there's a broader there's a broader question uh, uh, behind this, which uh, is you know uh, how does machine learning fit with, with, with mixed, with hierarchical uh, model, whether they're mixed, fixed, or, or random. And, and, and there's no absolute opposition because uh, a hierarchical model is one way of estimating a linear model. I can do prediction with a linear model, so I can uh, use a hierarchical model and then do prediction. Now, how much does that make sense? Uh, I'm not certain because uh, uh, hierarchical models are mostly about controlling the variance. Machine learning is most often doesn't explicitly model the variance, and that might be a, a, a bad thing, but most often doesn't explicitly model the variance. Uh, and, and so in, in general, uh, machine learning simply doesn't cater for these effects. 
Now, where it may uh, uh, be meaningful is, uh, uh, for instance, in the cross-validation scheme. And that's where it's really meaningful. Because if, I, if I'm using a hierarchical model, if I'm using a mixed defect or something like this, I, I have groups of samples, right? I have groups of samples. I may have multiple images that come from the same subject and multiple subjects. Uh, now I need to, to think, what is the generalization that I'm interested in? Am I interested in a generalization over subjects? In which case I need to do my cross-validation right and I need to leave out full subjects because if I leave out a fraction of the subjects, I, I, I've mixed the information. Am I interested, for instance, in a generalization across time, in which case I need another cross-validation uh, structure? So th this, I, I, I think this is the, the, the way of thinking about this, but, but we definitely have different conceptual uh, 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 worlds that can be bridged, uh, the, the gap can be bridged, but it's, it's not commonly done, and, and I don't think it's, it's easy to do if you're looking for reasonably simple answers. That to, to just to add to that, that that was sort of my take on the the question as well. Um, but I was I was thinking that um, uh, the the question about the random effects um, and adding to a cross validation. I mean, that's really just saying that the the variance is more predictive of your result, right? So so it seems to me that the the to answer that question about what more you can say about it you can you can basically develop a better prediction potentially right it's just a model uh, and so so even though they're the machine learning models are typically done differently and it's not my area of expertise but but it seems to me that that um just like with anything if your models are more explanatory and you have a better uh uh result cross validating that um you can you can say what what impacts that that outcome better, right? I don't know, off of the shrubs, maybe. No, that's that's great answers. Thank you both. Um, there's another one following along. JB the line. maybe has something to oh, say. Oh, is it JB? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to say the uh, maybe one way of thinking of the. Uh, uh, random uh, effects is to think of whether uh, that variable that you're thinking of is something that is being sampled. Uh, and therefore, you would like to generalize up on as well. Uh, so, uh, so that's a bit of a, like, you know, uh, just making sure that people see what's the difference between fixed and, and random effects. Like, you know, if you're, uh, if you're uh, you know, sampling across, um, uh, I don't know, like uh, 20 uh, neuro imaging sites, uh, those, are those sites uh, something that is fixed or is it is random? And, uh, and, and it really depends is whether you're thinking of your problem as, I would also like to derive some uh, inference on another site that I haven't sampled. Uh, and that's, so that's a little bit of a, you know, like a, maybe a framework yeah. to think about those things. Uh, yeah, something that, that's uh, uh, seldom um, uh, written is that uh, to, to, for generalization, you, in theory, and you, you basically need random X. You need your design matrix to be random elsewhere. The notion of generalization does not exist. Now that, that's a theoretical point, and it's more important if you're trying to, to, to derive theoretical control on what you're doing, but it's definitely true. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Thank you. And I see Satra uh, submitted a link to a nice blog post. Uh, so we'll get that shared with everyone after this, um, after this Q&A. So thank you all for putting your input. Uh, I think there is a question that's kind of related to the using cross-validation on a mixed effects model. Um, and I'm gonna pose this to Gael. Are there any special considerations we should be thinking about when performing machine learning with longitudinal data? Are simple linear models still appropriate? Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, I'll first ask the uh, first answer about, about linear models. Linear models are appropriate or not, depending on, on your sample size and on, on the complexity of the underlying question. Uh, and, and there's a, another question that, that relates to sample size, so I'll address this later. But it's somewhat independent from the, from the longitudinal problem. Now, the, the, uh, uh, with regard to machine learning on longitudinal data, so first a disclaimer, I haven't done this, you know, hugely. Uh, however, you know, the, the way I think about the problem, and I have done it a bit, is first, uh, what is the generalization that I want? And we're kind of back to the question before, you know, do I want to generalize across subjects? Do I want to generalize across time? And that's a really important question. And this will 
uh, guide uh, the, the, the way I input my data in the models and, and more importantly, the way I do my, my model validation, my, my cross validation schema. That's the, the first thing. And the second thing is how do I represent my, my data uh, in there? And, and depending on whether my data is regularly sampled or not in my longitudinal model, uh, and, and whether I want to resample it to a, re a regular sample, uh, uh, I, I may I, I may do something as simple as taking you know the the year one, year two, year three, and just shove this in, in the model, which may work. Or I may want to do things like a baseline and time differential that might be much more relevant, and then I just do feature stacking. Uh, this 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 should be enough, uh, but but I do have to worry about how to represent time and time evolution in the features of my model. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm going to switch back over to Tara. Um, univariate reliability appears to be less than multivariate reliability in fMRI. Uh, is this a consequence of overly simplistic univariate models, for example, by not including random effects? Or are there other factors that could reduce the reliability of univariate models on fMRI data? So this, this is one of those questions that I think I don't know enough about to answer intelligently. Mm -hmm. So I, I'll, I, I would have to look that up more. Maybe uh, other folks know more about this to answer. I haven't, had, I haven't taken time to, to read the, the paper that, that's, uh, yeah. that's uh, linked to the, I think it's by, by Stephanie Noble. Uh, but uh, the, the one thing I'd, li I'd like to, to you know, point out here is that uh, there's really actually a lot of confusion in the literature. And, and people usually when they say multivariate, they have in mind decoding, but I'm sorry, a generalized linear model is multivariate. It's just multivariate on, on the, the behavior space and not multivariate on, uh, on the voxel space. And the, the real difference is what's my input space and what's my output space between a standard analysis. I don't like the term univariate and multivariate because people get confused. So I say a standard analysis and a decoding. And I don't know if this question was opposing standard analysis and decoding, uh, but, but now if I'm gonna oppose standard analysis and decoding, and then now I need to be very careful about what I'm talking about. Uh, because you know, decoding naturally controls only the behavior that's decoded. And that's a much simpler thing to control than a full brain map. Now, if I'm looking at the reliability of brain maps in decoding versus standard analysis, uh, in my experience, the, re the, the, the reliability of brain maps and decoding, they're much, much less reliable. And uh, so I haven't read the paper, so I don't know, I don't know the, the point, but, but brain maps and decoding are much less reliable than brain maps and univariate. They also mean something different. Thank you. Um, and we have a question from the audience here. Uh, back to you, Gael. Um, regarding stacking multimodal nonlinear models, uh, how would you decide which combination of linear models to include in the tree model? I would, uh, uh, so for, for the kind of uh, data set uh, that, that, is, that, that we have in ABCD, I would really uh, do this based on, on, on my expertise and you know, other people's understanding of what should go in the model, you know, what's relevant. Uh, uh, it's, it's definitely very important. You know, you, we don't have enough data to shove everything in, shake something, and, and get something out. Right? We need to think about what we're going to put in there. And so, typically, uh, what what I like to do is to do large, you know, high-dimensional linear models per modality, or it could be per time point. Uh, but but and the reason being really that you know doing a linear model on a brain image makes sense because I'm basically learning a combination of voxels. And the combination of voxels is something that makes sense because this voxel grid is arbitrary. Now a combination of age and weight may or may not make sense, and you know it's probably not a linear combination. You know my hopefully my weight doesn't increase linearly with my age. Uh, uh, so in in this case I don't want to put a linear model on this. And on top of this, this is uh, um, uh, this is a low dimensional problem. So typically I'm gonna take my very high dimensional data such as uh, a brain image. I will uh, uh, do a linear model on this and, one, and I'll do this on each modality. And once I'm reduced to you know, a handful or many handfuls, but you know, no more than say a hundred models, then I can, I, can, I can put this in a nonlinear model. All right, thank you. Yeah, I think that helps clear that up. Um, so switching back to 
Tara. Um, this one, this person is still unsure how to set up a longitudinal model for fMRI data. He said there are many standard imaging analysis libraries such as FSL and SPM uh, are not set up for modeling the complex covariance structure present in longitudinal data and needed to create longitudinal models. In particular, I'm not sure how to run latent growth models on neuroimaging data or how to involve task data with behavioral covariates into these models. I can see somewhat how this is done in NeuroPointalist. Uh, you also mentioned that it's possible to use AFNI. Does that mean all analyses we do that include multiple waves uh, in the ABCD imaging study should be done in one of these two programs, either AFNI or NeuroPointalist, I'm presuming? I am guessing that, de yeah, depending on what kind of longitudinal uh, models you want to run, uh, you can use, basically, um, AFNI is a wrapper around R um, at ELMER and LME for certain types of models. Um, and uh, that's, that's well described. And if those models fit for you, um, and I haven't had a chance to play with the ABCD data yet, so I, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but I'm assuming that those will work. Um, so, so that would be how you, so you could certainly use AFNI for anything like latent growth models. Um, and, and in general, I've found it helpful to use uh, uh, NeuroPoint because it's, it's been very easy to take the model in R and work with the statistician, make sure it's correct. So in that case, what happens is you do the first level processing and you have a statistical map that comes out of that. And those statistics are your input into the longitudinal model that you then uh, create. So that's very simple for sort of resting state kinds of things where you're looking at the correlation of uh, the activity in one part of the brain to the rest. For a task-based analysis, then what you're looking at as your brain variable per each of the um, time points is a contrast. And so you'll take the contrast and then put, put that up to a higher level model. And that can be, so you can treat that essentially at exactly the same as you would treat any sort of behavioral variable as a, as a model in a, in a growth model. So perhaps that's the best way to think of it is that you're looking at the change in this contrast um, in a task analysis, exactly the same way you might be looking at any other variable that you collect about this person over time. Thank you. Yeah, did somebody else want to add something? So the next question uh, is also to deal with longitudinal models and specifically missing data. This is uh, probably a common question. How can we deal with missing data in longitudinal models? Is there a specific way to impute missing data in a longitudinal study? Is the process any different from imputing data in a cross-sectional study? So I have never actually imputed any any data. So what I have done was basically let, use, use models that handle missing data. Um, and so, you know, the mixed effects framework will, will do that just fine. And, um, and, that, and that is what we've done. You have to be careful, obviously, that you, your missing data is not structured in a way that causes your model estimation to be skewed or, or incorrect. And that, that is, you know, clearly a problem with sort of some longitudinal studies I've seen where uh, you have very few people left at the end. Um, and so you've got a very biased uh, type of sample. So the same, the, essentially, my take on it has been, um, and the people I've worked with, it, it's the the consensus has been that the um, the same type of rules that apply for any sort of missing data would apply for also the longitudinal analysis of MRI data, fMRI data. Uh, if I may, although I'm not not a complete expert in this, you know, there's a a common uh, um, source of missingness, which is very structured, which is uh, uh, censoring. And that, that, that's very uh, um, uh, plausible in a longitudinal data. Basically, you know, you, you, uh, you, you, you don't observe the long um, uh, uh, trajectories as much as the short one for any kind of reason, you know, subject dropout or something like this. And I, I, just, I just wanted to give the, the keyword uh, uh, censoring because there are a bunch of statistical models that can 
uh, model the censoring effect and that can be extremely useful to model this dropout. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you both. Uh, was there anything else that anyone wanted to add? Okay, then I'll move on to uh, the next question, which is to both of you. Um, are there types of research questions that can only be answered by longitudinal models or through machine learning? Or are they complementary approaches that provide different perspectives on the same research questions? Uh, Tara, we can start with you if you want. Um, so I, I, I think of these, uh, you know, as, as was said earlier, as kind of two different frameworks. So when I think about the longitudinal models that I'm familiar with, I think that, yes, certain questions about change and the structure of change can only be uh, answered by those frameworks. Um, that said, and I don't have as much experience with machine learning. That said, um, you know, I'm kind of a big fan of, 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 you know, thinking about the connection between these kinds of things. And I can imagine a lot of scenarios where, um, you know, you're looking at longitudinal change in something that you can only, a pattern that you can only identify through machine learning. How to do that, I don't know <laughs> exactly, but, but, I, but, I, but I imagine that, that the, the two approaches can of course be blended because they they help with different kinds of things but that's just my opinion so I, I you know I defer uh, um, to Gail so what do you think well I think um, you know the, the difference first first I don't think there's an, op an opposition you can build a longitudinal machine learning model and this can be done cleanly and rather than the hacky ways that I mentioned earlier uh, uh, but it's more but there's a fundamental difference in, in what I will, I will call inferential statistics and I'll, I'll, I'll probabilistic modeling and I'll use, use this term even though it's maybe not the right term. Uh, and, and machine learning is that in, in uh, the former, you're postulating a model, a linear model, a linear model plus spline, a longitudinal model, RFX, whatever. Uh, uh, and you're, you're fitting it and then you're concluding on the coefficients of your model. This is standard probabilistic modeling. It's been the, some of the paradigm that's been driving statistics for what, a hundred years? Uh, machine learning uh, doesn't need this paradigm. And machine learning, what, what it tells you is I'm going to estimate a function and I'm going to control the prediction uh, of this function. And in nowhere am I concluding on the parameters of my function. And, and we want to do this because we're used to the standard uh, paradigm, but, but, but we, we have weak guarantees on this. Now I can look at, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take the, the example that was uh, uh, put forward um, uh, earlier by Tara on, on looking at, for instance, uh, uh, structural changes in the brain. Uh, I, can, I can look at this with a machine learning model, but I'm, I'm likely, if I want good control, then to, to formulate this as an encoding model and to say, I'm going to try, for instance, to predict given a subject's uh, uh, behavioral traits and, and, and clinical file, I'm going to try to predict what are going to, the, the differences uh, of the, the subject's brain going to be. Now, if I do this, once again, I am, I'm, I'm trying to do, an inf to, to, to do a conclusion uh, on the subject brain, but I'm doing this as part of my prediction rather as part of my model parameters. So it's, how you frame the question, which tells you which tool you're going to use. And I, I, I definitely see value in using both in the same study. Right, thank you. Uh, I have a, another question for Tara. Uh, I'm having trouble trying to understand how each of the different models mentioned in the longitudinal lecture are mathematically different from each other. My understanding is that all of the models you mentioned, simple linear regression, repeated measures in OVA, linear mixed effects, and latent growth models, all share the same base equation for, but involve different types of terms. Are the differences between the model types mostly because you're including terms that involve interactions between within and between subject factors? In in part, it's 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 the the terms that are included, 
but it's also for for because latent growth models was in there, right? So so the, there's a big difference when you when you start talking about latent variables because then you are um, you're you're working on essentially a different framework uh, to to do that. So um, uh, that gives you a lot more flexibility because you can use change as a predictor. So I, I would say, I, th I think like to simplify, I think that that change as a predictor and the latent um, growth model structure, which gives you a lot more flexibility about what you can do is probably the biggest distinguishing factor. And, and the rest of the models sort of fall into the same uh, framework of, of mixed effects and uh, are, are simpler in a sense. Thank you. Um, and I think this next one is for both of you. Uh, can I build a predictor using a mixed effects model like through scikit-learn? Uh, does a mixed effects model provide any unique advantages as a predictor uh, if we conceptualized it as a scikit-learn predictor? So I guess as opposed to the other predictors that could be that one could choose from. I, I think if I we're doing a temporal learn, analysis, yeah. I can answer the scikit-learn bit because I, I know mm -hmm. scikit-learn reasonably well. So scikit-learn doesn't have hierarchical models, <clears throat> and I, it's not clear why we would add this because it goes back to an earlier question. So yes, I can fit a linear model with with a hierarchical uh, model, and this can be interesting because uh, I'll, I'll control my variance, and this may be interesting but how am I going to use it? Uh, so you're going to give me a new subject and you know, the hierarchical model is going to tell me that there's part of the variance of the new subject that is explained by the model and part of the variance that is not explained. So maybe there is work to be done there to be able to then uh, conclude on the reliability of my prediction on the new subject saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm expecting to explain, you know, this fraction of variance in the new subject. Uh, I, I don't know of such work, but it, maybe it has been done. It makes sense. Uh, uh, it will require probably some careful statistical writing. Uh, so um, not easy, I would say. Possible, but not easy. <clears throat> Did you have anything to add? Uh, no, I, I, I'm unfamiliar with Psykit, so. Uh, yeah. All right, then we'll move on to the next question. Um, this one is semi-related. Does any analysis of multi-wave ABCD data need to be a longitudinal analysis? So is there any way that we could look at different time points and avoid using a, a longitudinal model? And there's a follow-up question. How does machine learning fit into this framework? So I think we've covered this a, a little bit already, um, but if there's anything else to add in the, this context. So Tara, yeah, you yeah, can start I, with. The longitudinal, I don't, I don't see why you couldn't take a single time point and, and do an analysis of that if that, that was appropriate to your question. Um, so in longitudinal studies, we would often look at cross-sectional studies within that, that were nested within that and, uh, um, and, and take that approach. So, so it's, it was just really about what you're looking at. So uh, if I may, uh, you, you can, you know, you can take a longitudinal study and forget it's longitudinal and, and basically, you know, see this as a, you know, many images that you're modeling. If you're going to do this, you're going to get the covariance of the, across the samples wrong. Uh, the thing is, is, if you're just trying to predict, it may not be important. If you're trying to get confidence intervals, p-values on coefficients, if you've gotten the, you know, the correlations between your sample wrong, you're going to get your, 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 your p-values completely wrong. Uh, and so it kind of goes back to how do you validate what you're doing, and it goes back to cross-validation. The thing is, machining doesn't validate its models via a, 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 a probabilistic model. It basically validates its model by looking at uh, uh, observed error uh, and uh, and seeing whether that observer error is good or bad. And I use the term good or bad uh, purposely because unfortunately in machine learning, we, we, we very seldom use uh, statistical tests on these things and uh, that's a big problem. And it, it, if you look at how to do those statistical tests, they're hard. 
And so that's one reason why people don't do them. But I'd like to say that uh, uh, if you're anywhere close to um, um, uh, air, air bounds, if you're anywhere close to, to the confidence intervals, then your machine learning model may or may not be significant, but it's in no way useful. So uh, I don't know why we would be doing that. We should probably be doing standard, you know, uh, in, in standard statistical practice. So I, I just wanted to make, make clear, I was answering perhaps the incorrect question, which was, can you take a single time point of a longitudinal study and perform an, an analysis on that? And I, I was not thinking about pooling. That, that's so, <laughs> so, so thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate that. <laughs> but I, I want to I start that if you're going to do, you know, p-values and standard statistical inference, uh, please don't pool your data. Please <laughs> write. <laughs> <laughs> it, it didn't even come to mind as a thing you should do. So I, 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 I didn't even interpret the question that way. Thank you. <laughs> All right, well, thank you for getting that cleared up. Very important. Um, I have a, another question for Tara. In one of the previous lectures, we learned that some behavioral measures in the ABCD study change over time because measures that were appropriate for younger participants become no longer appropriate as the participants age. In the longitudinal modeling lecture, um, he said that longitudinal analysis should ideally involve measurements that do not change over time. How big of a deal is this uh, for running longitudinal analyses on the ABCD data set? Is it possible? Yeah, so I think I think that you know the idea behind that, and I and I don't know the context of the ABCD specific here, but the the idea behind that is you know um, like with with aging, for example, you may have a test that no longer makes any sense, so you kind of get garbage as as you know people become. Uh, impaired or something like that. So to study, so since you're measuring a different construct that's changing over time, it does not make sense to put that into a longitudinal model and look at its prediction of brain, for example, over time, because you're going to get garbage, essentially. So I imagine that that um, that the context is something like that, where there's some measures that no longer make sense for older children. And, and, um, and, and so when posing a longitudinal study, then it, I think it's important to think about the time frame or when that model um, makes sense. Um, so of course, you know there there are plenty of things that have more um, structure to them over time, and and plenty of things that probably change. And you can also test that as well. You know, you can, uh, which I'm sure has been done in this context, to look at the the measurements and the stability of what they're measuring over time, and and see that. So similarly, you can do the same, you know, with with the brain and see whether the um, whether essentially the fit of the longitudinal model makes sense, um, uh, assuming some trajectory or some relationship. Um, so, so there's a variety of ways that you can both explore the, the stability of the longitudinal measurement and, um, and choose what to use over time. So, so I think it's just, it's a conceptual question more than anything else. I'll, I'll jump in here real quick also just to add that it really is like so many of our answers dependent on the research question and and so obviously there are some measures that we don't assess in the ABCD um, in the ABCD sample at different time points um, but some of them for, let me just say, for example, executive function. The way that you would probe executive function among nine and 10 year old children is dramatically different from how you would probe it from 16, 17, 18 year old um, kids. So the idea is that depending on what your research question is, depending on how that construct was probed and how it needed necessarily the measure to have changed, there may be some questions that you can ask where the measure itself changed, but only because of the developmental context. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of wiggle room. There, there's so many different measures in the ABCD data set. There's so many different measures that change um, and that don't change. So it really sort of depends on, again, everything you put into the model needs to be done um, in a really informed way and with consultation with statisticians who are, are sort of fully aware of, of the various different approaches. So to follow up on that, are we saying that we could potentially use the different measures in the same model as long as we like massage the data in some way to try to get at the underlying construct that the measures are trying to 
measure? I don't know that that's been done, and I'm I'm certainly not recommending that we just sort of blindly jump in and do it. I, I am saying that specifically with the example of executive function, if you want to assess how that construct changes over time, then you will by necessity need to involve assessments that have changed over time. Thank you. All right. So it looks like we have another question from the audience. Uh, can Tara further explain the limitations slash disadvantages of analyzing data that are close in time? Can this be avoided by an initial step of analyzing, say, at least three data points that are far apart before including all longitudinal data points? Uh, I think I need a little more clarification on this. Like if, if the point being that if you have things that are too close in time, you're not going to see change. Um, I think that that's yeah. what that's referring to. So, uh, so I'm assuming that you don't necessarily have a lot of choice on your time structure. Um, and what you can do is if you're worried about that, you know, you simply look to see whether uh, a model that predicts like say linear change or something like that, or whatever growth function you think should be there, whether that's significant or not, whether that's different from a, a null model where there is no change, that, that, that would be the kind of approach that I would have thought to, to, to do with that. Again, a statistician may have a better idea, but I, I think that there's principled approaches to checking um, what, what model fit you should be looking at depending on the, your time structure. Thank you. Yeah, I think that helps. Um, so I'm going to switch over to a question for Gail. Uh, do all machine learning models involve using a training and testing data set? Um, when you went over the decoding section of the talk, I was a little confused about where the testing data set came from and, uh, or how it came into play for the decoding analyses. Well, then my talk was not clear. Uh, yeah, um, all um, machine learning models, well, m machine learning methodology by, by definition as a training and a test set, it comes from two reasons. One is uh, the, you know, the goal of machine learning is, I was about to say it's to, it's to estimate a prediction function, but actually I, I, I think that's too, it, it's, it, it, can, it can be broader. But the whole validity of it is it minimizes a prediction error. And, and minimizing this prediction error may be useful for more than prediction. It can be used for, used for causal inference. It's used a lot for causal inference these days. Uh, but, but the whole validity of it is it controls the prediction error. It controls an error between a, an explained why and a natural why. And the only reliable way of measuring this is via cross-validation. And now there's a tiny bit of a debate between some statisticians, some old style statistician, who find it frustrating to take a large data set, remove some samples and not use them in model fits, and want to come up with a procedure that is more efficient statistically and that can use all the data. Those procedures do exist. There are some of them. However, they always come with important caveats. They only work uh, if uh, your model is in a given model family, the data is drawn under certain conditions. And I'd say um, one of the things that the machine learning community likes about cross-validation is uh, it's reasonably easy to do right. And if you've done it right, you, you have a non-parametric control. Uh, so, I would say, yes, uh, uh, you always need to have a train and a test set. And even in decoding, this is what we do. And we use this to check uh, our model validity. And I'd like to ask a, a follow-up for splitting onto test and training. Would, uh, so with the ABCD data set, we are working with longitudinal data. So if we are using a longitudinal model, we would want to make sure all the data points from one participant would be uh, inside either the training or the testing data set uh, solely, correct? And well, I, I, yeah. yeah, this this is what I would do. You could you could think about more complex scheme that would be legit, like you mm -hmm. know leaving out only 
for some participants leaving uh, uh, out only the later time points. But in practice, how are you going to instance state this? You know, you get new new participants, then you need to retrain the machine learning model. So people do this. It's known as trans transductive learning, for instance. But it's completely impractical. I think it's a very academic question that that has little use. <clears throat> And then uh, I think just also related to that uh, is there, how should we consider missing data when we're doing our test training splits? Well, it's uh, kind of interesting. I, I, I don't really see how missing this comes in, into part. So say you have a longitudinal study and you're missing some of the time points. If you're gonna split on, on participants, you're going to put participants in your test set that that have all their their missing data so then then maybe the question is how do i predict with missing data and uh, uh, then there are kind of two ways of, of, of going at it you can either impute and if you have a longitudinal study typically you impute with a time model or you can have a model that you know natively deals with missingness because uh, we're, we're back to informative missingness it, it may be informative it, it's may or may not be the case in the ABCD uh, uh, data set, but it may be informative that, that there is missingness. So for, I'm looking at school grades and I'm missing some school grades. This may indicate that the kid was sick, the kid couldn't go to school because there was a snowstorm or, or something. Uh, and this may tell us something about that, uh, the education of, of the kid. Uh, and, uh, and very often, by the way, the, the missingness is informative. And this is why I often like to use machine learning models that can cater for for missingness but but back to you know the, the validity of cross validation the the, imp, the the important point of the validity of cross validation is that your train set must be independent from your test set and so typically if you so for instance if you if, if you're doing time series <coughs> and those time series you know they're correlated and and you want to predict uh, if you if you uh, split your data typically you're, you're gonna you're gonna add a gap between your train uh, your, your train set and your test set to create this independence. So that's really the most important aspect of the validity of cross validation. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna switch to Tara here for another question. Do you have any advice on how to create design matrices and the associated contrast structure? for longitudinal studies. It's pretty difficult sometimes to set up these design matrices and I'm not sure how to do it when running latent growth models that involve bold data. Well, with, um, so for, for latent growth models with bold data, first of all, as soon as you're talking about latent growth models um, and bold data, then you would absolutely be talking about doing something in, in, in NeuroPoint because I don't know of any, um, uh, any other platform that would do something like that. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping by bold data, um, we're thinking about, uh, again, this framework of having done a first order analysis and then using that in um, a, a higher level kind of analysis. So again, using the statistical maps that come from the first order analysis, whether it be a contrast or not. So then, then I, and I can answer with respect to NeuroPoint, um, what you do, it's it's actually fairly straightforward. Um, you're, you need to create a table of your variables. Um, so suppose you have a contrast that you're looking at over time, then basically you're you're really just creating it, you know, a table like you would almost again think of it like for if you knew if you're familiar with R, um, you're just talking about uh, setting things up so that you have for each contrast, for each time point, you know, a variable time, a variable subject. Um, and then all the other covariates that you care about, you can put them in the same file or separate file. Then it's as simple as just an R model. And that's one of the things I really enjoyed about using uh, that framework was, was that quite frankly, generating contrasts and contrast files and um, the, uh, um, <sighs> And the design matrices was 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 one of the first things I learned how to do. It's kind of a mess, so I never I never liked that part. So it's much nicer. It was much nicer for me to work in R to do that. Um, so I have never tried to to actually do a longitudinal model repeated measures on bold data. Um, so the the structure of that would be somewhat different, and I don't. I, I would definitely get a statistician to talk to about that. All right, thank you. Yeah, 
so it's complex. So was somebody else about to add something? Okay, then I will switch over to Gail again. This one, this question is about the cursive dimensionality. So you talked about heterogeneity as not being a, a roadblock, provided that you have enough data. The ABCD data set is indeed a very rich data set with many different dimensions and a huge amount of heterogeneity across subjects. Fortunately, there's also quite a lot of data. Uh, if we want to perform a machine learning analysis using ABCD data, uh, what are some considerations that we just think about as we build a model to avoid running into dimensionality and heterogeneity problems? Well, I'll, I'm going to give a recipe that I think would be a good one. For uh, the imaging data, uh, typically you reduce it on some form of atlas. Now, a reasonably fine atlas, you know, an atlas with a thousand parcels is a fine atlas. And I have my favorite for bold data. It's uh, the FUMO uh, that was designed exactly for this purpose. <clears throat> but um, um, if, you, if you're going to do a, you know, a, a, a predictive model and you have two high dimensions, chances are it won't work. And of course, when you're reducing on an atlas, you might be missing some very fine grain information. But we're looking across subjects. We're looking you know, with the inter-individual variability. Uh, if we're looking at a thousand parcels, you're probably at the, the, the level uh, that, that's about right to capture across subjects. Maybe two or 3,000 would be better, but uh, I don't know of any atlases that big. Uh, so now you're down to a thousand features per, uh, 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 per modality. That's already starting to look better, you know, considering that you've got almost 13,000 subjects. And you may want it to do the stacking approach uh, to reduce this even further. Uh, but that's the first way of taming uh, the curse of dimensionality. And now back to heterogeneity. Uh, um, there's a lot of wrong intuitions on, on heterogeneity in, 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 in your imaging because we always work with linear models. And a linear model, when you think of it, is making the same decision for everyone. The way a linear model does, it's completely invariant in space. Now, if I have a nonlinear model, that's no longer the case. And, and, and I, I no longer have to you know, design groups because the nonlinear model will, will somewhat implicitly for me do it in the sense that it will use decision rules that differ across the different subjects in some way. And so, you know, heterogeneity, if you're really worried about this, use a, a nonlinear model, maybe a weekly nonlinear one, but use a weekly nonlinear model, I would say. So something like a, 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 a not too deep random forest, that's, that's one way of uh, taming. So, you know, a linear model per, uh, uh, per modality and a not too deep random model, a uh, 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 forest to combine them, for instance. All right, thank you. Uh, and then additionally, um, Related to dimensionality, uh, Tara had a question for you. So instead of running a mixed model, say on each voxel, could you reduce the data to some parcellation that would be include 400, 2000 uh, using an atlas and uh, run that model across all the parcels instead of across each individual voxel? I guess, is there something that you think that we gain when we run uh, the analysis on each voxel versus grouping the brain up into parcels? I think I think that it that I, I think there's nothing wrong with doing the parcels. I, th I think and but it just depends on how good your par parcels are. Your parcelation is so you know a lot of the the thinking of the voxel wise analysis was based on the fact that we had kind of you know not so necessarily great fMRI data and and uh, not not particularly awesome methods for parcelation. Um, the better your parcelation and especially if you're able to track. Uh, you know, uh, individual differences in parcels, that it would be awesome. I mean, and I think you'd gain an enormous amount to do that. Um, but it was really just um, a, a lot of the motivation for my personally looking at voxel-based measures was because we had so, we did so much stuff um, looking at how to do good functional parcellations and just ended up with noise after noise after noise. And, and, and it might've been our methods, it might've been something else, but, but um, I, I would say that, uh, 
that was one of the motivations for for taking the hit that way uh, to with the with all of the um, uncertainty about about boundaries of parcels. That was why we looked at the uh, the voxel based approaches. So in short, if you have a good me me method to parcelate, please use it. That's a great idea. And also on that note too, you know, the AFNI group has done an amazing once once you reduce the number of parcels, obviously, you you can be have more stronger uh, correction for multiple comparisons and and other such kinds of things. And AFNI group has done a lot of work with Bayesian statistics and parcelation to to move in that direction to address some of the issues of loss of power um, caused by the voxel um uh, measures. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Uh, and we just have one more question. This one's for Gail. Uh, in the machine learning lecture, it was mentioned that one of the ways to get around the issues of intrinsic uncertainty and model validation is to make sure that we have a large enough data set uh, that we're working with. Can you help me understand what exactly large enough means? And I'm going to Guess that the answer means depends. Sure, it means it depends, but there are you know there are two aspects to it. One is, uh, do I have enough data to have a model that predicts well? And the other one is, do I have you know some form of confidence that the model prediction that I've I've uh, observed is actually reliable? Now that for for the second one, I just like to go back to the simple binomial model. It's you know it's it's simplified, but it's still quite useful. You know, I can just take a binomial law and compute the confidence intervals of my observed prediction accuracy. Now, that's, that's true if it's a classification. If it's a regression, well, it's harder. But, uh, and, and that will tell me uh, uh, if, if, I, if I can somewhat uh, trust uh, uh, my, my model validation. And I should really be doing this because it's going to tell me somewhat my error bounds. And it's quite important to keep in mind that that you know if my if my model accuracy if my and, and even if my improvements in model accuracy are within the air bounds I should stop. And then, do I have enough data to have a good prediction? Is is you know data my limiting factor? Uh, is the quantity of data my limiting factor? And to answer this question, there's a, a tool that's extremely useful, which is known as the learning curve. I've shown the learning curve in my course. Uh, for the autism uh, prediction uh, uh, setting. And what we do here is that we take the whole data set and we downsample it and we increase the uh, amount of data in the, in the train set. And, and ideally we do this with a fixed test set. We increase and we, you know, we sample another test set, we increase and we look at how well the, 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 the prediction accuracy increases. And if it plateaus, it means no data is not what I need. I need more complex models, I need better data. If it keeps going up, it means just give me more data and my model will improve. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that was very useful. Uh, and that was the last question for today. And I think we're about out of time. So uh, thank you so much for answering all my questions and the questions from the audience. <laughs> thank you both, Gail and Tara, for joining us today. I hope you had a good time. and. We appreciate everybody tuning in for our, our week 12 questions. Yes, definitely. Thank you both. And uh, look forward to uh, uh, more discussions as we go forward. Thanks a lot Thanks for having everybody. me. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.